All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining on this call and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jude. I work at Blockstack and Blockstack is a startup company that's trying to build a new internet for decentralized applications. Um, just a bit about myself, like who is this guy speaking? Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Princeton University, almost done. Um, I've worked for Blockstack since May, 2015. Um, I was their first engineering hire and my uh, background is in decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems um, that span the wide area. And you can see my uh, screenshot of my profile here in Blockstack, or at least one of them, uh, jude.personal.id, and I'm a Blockstacker. Um, so what problems are we trying to solve here uh, with Blockstack? So maybe it's, it's best to explain this by way of an example. Um, suppose that you want to sign into Facebook and you want to go, uh, you know, just use Facebook. Well, in, in the, between typing in www.facebook.com and signing in and loading your data, there's a lot of other things that happen in the background. Uh, the first thing that has to happen is if you want to talk to Facebook, you have to have Facebook's signed certificate and you have to have the set of certificates who have signed those certificates all the way back up to a root certificate authority. These normally come in your web browser or they come from your operating system vendor like Windows or Linux or Mac. Um, you are free to go and audit them, but let's be realistic, most people don't even know that they're there. They're this implicit trusted party that gives you certificates that allow you to use HTTPS to connect to Facebook. Um, so once you, so when you sign into facebook.com, the first thing that happens is your browser um, loads up the certificate that facebook.com sends and verifies that it was signed by the authorities that you implicitly trust. Um, the second thing that happens um, sorry, not really necessarily in this order, but the second, what, what will happen in the process of loading Facebook.com is you will have to resolve Facebook.com to an IP address, and that's achieved via the DNS system. So you do a DNS lookup to turn Facebook.com into an IP address. You connect to that IP address via the SSL protocol. You verify the, um, connect, the uh, handshake is successful by ensuring that the certificates and are signed appropriately. And finally, you can get to Facebook's sign-in page. Uh, when you get to the sign-in page, you have to type in your name and your password, and Facebook then proceeds to load your data on your behalf. You don't really have direct access to your data. You're technically loading it through Facebook as a trusted intermediary. And technically, all three of these are trusted intermediaries. And they're all single points of failure. If any one of them breaks or misbehaves, you can't get to your data. Or worse, you'll get to data an attacker wants you to see, which is really the type of catastrophic failure mode that certificate authorities in particular were designed to prevent. But nevertheless, certificate authority compromises are definitely possible. So what problems are we trying to solve? We're trying to get rid of these hidden trusted middlemen so you can just get at your data directly. So there's hidden trusted parties on the internet right now. And they're, they pose single points of failure. And unfortunately for you, if you use Facebook, you're not really the user of Facebook, you're the product of Facebook. Or more specifically, your attention is the product of Facebook because Facebook is gonna read your data and they're going to use that data to serve you advertiser, to serve you advertisements. And that's what people actually pay Facebook for, um, to serve you ads. So like back in the early, like late 90s, I'm sorry, early 2000s, there was this motto going around from Google that kind of was um, the indicative of the ethos of the time, which is don't be evil. But as it turns out, and as uh, Mr. Snowden here had um, revealed to the world, don't be evil is not good enough. Unfortunately, bad things can happen to your data in part because there are these hidden trusted parties and these single points of failures and there's perverse incentives that cause the people that you entrust with your data to read it and do things with it behind your back. So what we're trying to do at Blockstack is stop these things from happening, um, is the short of it. Don't be evil isn't a good enough standard. What we want are applications that can't be evil. It should not be possible for applications to read my data without my consent. It should not be possible for um, failures in the DNS system or certificate authorities getting compromised to lead to the mass scale compromises of people's computers like we have seen today. What we really want is the application to really host nothing. The application should just give me a view of my data, but it shouldn't be responsible for hosting it. I should be responsible for hosting it because it's my data as a user. This also goes for my identities. I shouldn't be relying on Facebook to say that I am who I am. I say who I say that I am who I am. 
So can we build web applications in a way where the application doesn't host data and isn't trusted for providing identity services? It turns out that we can, and this is the uh, technology system that uh, Blockstack has designed. And the way that Blockstack works under the hood, just the 10,000 foot view here is, instead of there being these trusted middle parties and Facebook being one of them, Facebook is just yet another user that you allow to read your data. What really happens is when I sign into, when I use this application or use any application with Blockstack, I read and write my data directly to the storage provider that I choose. Like for example, I personally choose to host my data in a bucket on Microsoft Azure. All of my data for Blockstack apps gets hosted there, but I get to choose that. I, have, I know other people who run their own servers that get to host their data on their servers. Um, our, the co-founder of Blockstack, Ryan, uh, uses a Heroku instance to host all of his Blockstack data. But the point is, the hosting, hosting data is no longer the, the application's responsibility. What happens instead is, I simply write my encrypted data directly to my storage provider, and it's encrypted in a way so that only the people that I want to read it will be able to decrypt it. So that's the cluster of computers on the right side of this slide here, the others. So Facebook is a consumer of data that I allow to read, that I explicitly consent to allow to read, and others include like my friends, my coworkers, my colleagues. They load and they verify and decrypt data directly from my storage provider of choice. But there's a bootstrapping problem in here. How do I discover the right keys to use to encrypt data? So if Alice wants to share data with Bob, Alice has to get Bob, Alice has to get Bob's public key. The problem with this is that there aren't any good solutions today, I mean, not up until Blockstack that is, that made this relative as straightforward as it could be. Um, in particular, users are currently forced to have to deal with public keys and dealing with public key revocations and a giant quagmire of key management that's very difficult and tedious for even technically inclined users to do. So what Blockstack does is it automates a lot of this process in a secure manner. It uses a shared blockchain between your Blockstack node and other people's Blockstack nodes to establish a list of public keys that is cryptographically immutable. So it can't, once your name is in public key is registered, it can't be taken away from you. This is used to bootstrap the trust problem so Alice can find Bob's public key by looking at her view of the blockchain. And Bob will have the same view of that blockchain so he can get Alice's key. Um, there's also the problem of discovering the right storage system to read out of. So if Alice stores her data to, um, to um, uh, Microsoft Azure, how does Bob know to read it? Well, Blockstack facilitates that discovery problem, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but the point is, Blockstack provides developers with a similar development developer experience as something like Firebase, but behind the scenes, there aren't the same central trusted points of trusted points of control in the system. Users have direct access to their data, and we use end-to-end -end encryption to ensure that only the user's intended recipients can view that data. So Blockstack builds itself as a new internet for decentralized applications. And by that, we mean it provides the core, service for core services for decentralized applications. These include an identity management system, a storage system that's decentralized insofar as that lets users control where their data gets hosted and who's allowed to read it. And by virtue of the fact it uses an underlying blockchain to securely distribute public keys, it also provides a means to implement a payment mechanism via cryptocurrencies. Um, the, however, the uh, blockchain itself's primary role in this system is to simply bootstrap trust between nodes and between users. So, one so for those of you in the audience who are familiar with systems like Ethereum or other or EOS or other smart contract platforms. This slide is for you here. Like, how is Blockstack different from these systems? Because it sounds like we're trying to solve a similar problem. And to some extent, we are. But the design philosophy that Blockstack has is fundamentally different. Um, Blockstack makes judicious use of the end-to-end -end argument for system design. So what that means is we push as much complexity in the system to the edges. So Blockstack does not yet have its own blockchain. What it does instead is it uses the Bitcoin blockchain in a particular way to encode public key, uh, public key directory service. That's all it needs the blockchain for. It doesn't need to put smart contracts into the blockchain. It doesn't need to put application code into the blockchain. It just uses the blockchain as a very simple database.
the complexity of discovering your storage system, of doing the reads and writes, of running the application, that runs at the edge of the network instead of the core of the network. This is direct, the direct opposite of Ethereum's approach. Um, Blockstack is also the embodiment of another design principle by the same person or same group of people who came up with the end-to-end -end argument called the trust-to-trust -trust principle. And that states that users, not servers, are the trusted authoritative endpoints for data. And this is much closer to how the people who use Facebook see themselves in the role, in the role of a social media application. I say my Facebook profile, I say my wall, my photos. I do not say the copy of the photos that I have put on Facebook that I expect Facebook to faithfully serve to other people. That is the technically correct explanation of what's happening behind the scenes, but that suggests that those photos are not mine. And technically they are not mine because Facebook is not built in a way that lets me own their own data. However, Blockstack is built around precisely this premise. Users do own their own data and users are the trusted endpoints and the servers are just there to host downstream replicas of that data. They are only trusted to keep the data available. They are not trusted for correctness. Delving a bit deeper into the Blockstack architecture, there are three layers, roughly speaking, about what makes Blockstack possible. The bottommost layer is the blockchain. The Blockstack system currently uses the Bitcoin blockchain and it is portable across multiple blockchains. In fact, it used to use the Namecoin blockchain until 2015, where we discovered that Namecoin was insufficiently secure. So our design philosophy has always been to use the most secure blockchain and currently that's Bitcoin. So right now what happens is Blockstack uses the hash power and security of Bitcoin to keep the system stable. And by that, I mean, make sure that the public key directory system it implements doesn't get changed through something like a reorg or a network partition or something like that. So in the, the white box to see in this diagram at the bottom of the blockchain, sitting above that are specially crafted transactions that are valid Bitcoin transactions, but they carry some extra metadata that's meaningful to Blockstack. These are just name transactions in this in this diagram here. So name transactions encode things like register a name with this key or update this name or transfer this name to a new key. They also point to data that lives outside of the chain that I've, that I've called routing state in this diagram. It's in the middle here. That routing state is how you discover for a particular name where their storage providers live. So if you look up my name, for example, jude.id, you'll see some URLs in the routing state that point to a couple of servers. Now, the routing state in turn points to the third layer, the storage layer, which, point, um, which contains cloud storage providers. This could be any commodity cloud storage provider. It could be anything from your home personal server to something like Amazon to a BitTorrent swarm. It, it really doesn't matter because we've abstracted those details in the implementation. But what the routing state really points to is a um, piece of block stack called a Gaia node. So Gaia is a storage system that's built with Blockstack that is responsible for um, authenticating your reads and your writes to your data. Gaia nodes don't host any data of their own. What they do is they send the writes that you give them to the cloud storage providers of your choice so that later on they can be read back. The routing state points to Gaia nodes and then the Gaia nodes um, that, that you own um, point to your preferred storage provider. The idea being that your name points to your Gaia Hub, which points to your preferred storage. Therefore, you control where your data is hosted. And also by extension, you control who is allowed to read and to write to it. So the second layer here, let me just we'll, we'll approach this in a bottom up fashion. The second layer, the identity layer implements naming and PKI. So public key infrastructure using a commodity blockchain, in our case, Bitcoin. It can be thought of as DNS for people. It's hierarchically organized. There's a notion of namespaces, AKA top level domains in the system, like I'm Jude.id. .id is a top level domain in this system. It supports operations, um, updates, transfers, renewals, revocations. Each of those is encoded as a transaction in the Bitcoin blockchain that is parsed and replayed by a Blockstack node when it's uh, up and running. Names are given out in a first come, first, curve, first serve basis. So because I have jude.id, nobody else can claim it. Even if they send the transaction to do so, the Blockstack servers of the world would just ignore it. Um, and anybody can register a name or a namespace. So if the name is available, it's up for grabs. There's no registrars to go through. Um, all you have to do is just send a transaction to claim it. Uh, the same goes for top level domains. Uh, right now we have three. There's .id, there's .hello world, and there's .podcast. 
and we have a few more on the way. But like I said, anybody can register a namespace. They can be as many as 19 characters long, so there's, we're not gonna run out anytime soon. So within the identity layer, um, the identity layer is primarily responsible for building up a database. See, the blockchain transactions um, in the earlier slide encode a database log. That database log can be thought of as a set sequence of SQL commands that insert and update rows into a table. An example of this table is shown here. By replaying this log, I build up a table that contains everybody's names, the hashes of everybody's public keys, as well as the hashes of all of their routing state. So these are actual values taken from my table. Jude.id has the public, cache, public key hash uh, 16EMANW, et cetera, and then the routing state hash given. Uh, same for cicero.respublica.id in this table here. So because the Bitcoin blockchain is stable and very, very secure insofar as blockchains are considered, um, everybody gets the same table here when they start up a block stack node because the Bitcoin blockchain looks the same to everybody, as in everybody's copy of the Bitcoin blockchain um, is not easily reorganized. So the nodes replay the transactions locally to implement, to instantiate this database, and they can do so independently of one another. And because the Bitcoin blockchain is hard to reorganize, this basically solves the key distribution and revocation problem. The whole world of Blockstack users know my public key now because I registered Jude.id. If you run a Blockstack node, you will independently calculate that public key just by reading the Bitcoin blockchain. And similarly, if I ever change my public key or if I ever revoke the name Jude.id, you'll also know because your Blockstack nodes will, process, will each independently process it and come to the same conclusion. So the identity layer also contains some off-chain routing state. The hash of that is put in the blockchain, but because the routing state is about 40 kilobytes, um, the, we cannot fit it inside of a transaction. Uh, instead, what we do is we put the hash of the routing state in the transaction, and we put the routing state into a peer network that makes that each of the block stack nodes participate in. So this routing state, I have an example down here, is formatted like a DNS zone file. Um, but the takeaway here is that it's just pointers to where your data is hosted, is where your data is hosted. Now, everybody's routing state is fully replicated to every single block stack node. So if you run a block stack node, you will have everybody's routing state. So it's very easy to figure out where cicero.respublica.id hosts their data because you will already have a copy by the time your application attempts to load it. So you can see here, you have the origin and TTL fields you'd expect in the DNS zone file. But importantly, you also have this URI record that points to gaia.blockstack.org slash hub slash the hash of that person's public key. So that's an HTTPS URL. You can use node fetch to go load data from it. Um, it's really just an alias for a um, Microsoft Azure bucket that happens to host the encrypted data that this person has put in. So that brings us to the storage layer, Gaia. We really emphasize reusing um, commodity storage systems when possible, like Amazon has extremely high uptime, same with Azure, um, same with Dropbox, same with your home server. Um, they're much easier to reason about than something like um, a Swarm or IPFS. Um, the data is signed and encrypted either way, so it's not like um, anybody's gonna be able to read it without your permission. But what you can do is you can leverage the high availability that these services offer. And you get to choose which ones host your data, so if they ever misbehave or give you a bad uh, cost performance trade-off, you're free to switch. This basically turns these systems into dumb hard drives. Like you don't probably don't really care what kind of hard drive you have in your laptop right now. Uh, just as long as it works. And so we would like it to be for a cloud storage system. They're just um, hard drives in the cloud that you can just choose to use. Then you just pick the one that gives you the best bang for your buck. So in Gaia, each application gets its own virtual bucket. Um, so their app your application um, states are all kept separate from one another for safety. And each application also gets its own private key. So there's, there's no key sharing between applications. Each application gets its own storage, its own keys. They can't trap on one another. The worst they can do is misbehave and destroy their own data. And it looks a bit like this under the hood. So each name in the system ultimately resolves to a profile. And if you go to explorer.blockstack.org, you can see the set of profiles that exist. So in this example, judecnelson.id, which is another one of my IDs, is owned by my master key on the Bitcoin blockchain. And you have the hash of that already because the Blockstack node built that up when it built its name database. 
through the routing state, that points to a JSON web token that's signed by that master key that, among other things, contains a list of the applications that I use. Each of these applications, like public.yklao.com or app.graphitedocs.com, these each point to the data for these specific applications. And each of these applications has its own key. And they're stored separately in separate virtual buckets um, so, that as, so, that you, so that they don't accidentally trample on one another. Okay. So anybody can run a block stack node. They are pretty efficient. They take about 10 gigabytes of disk, and that's being extremely pessimistic. I think it takes like half of that right now, but I'm just extrapolating into the future. They don't take that much RAM, about as much as a Chrome tab, like a big Chrome tab. Uh, and they build up the name database for you. In addition, um, they implement a RESTful API endpoint. Uh, we have a public one running, which you can use at any time at core.blockstack.org. And we also give a profile explorer at explorer.blockstack.org. Um, it's all open source. It's all GPL3. Um, anybody can run their own copies if they want. Um, to get started as a user, um, what you would do is you would download a copy of the Blockstack browser, and that basically implements a, a, a wallet for your names. Um, it stores your master private key. It helps you manage your profiles. It lets you register multiple names. It has a Bitcoin wallet in it. Uh, we also have a hosted version at browser.blockstack.org. Um, there's a bit of an onboarding process to get the user set up. They get a 12-word mnemonic, a BIP39 mnemonic. Um, they don't have to buy a username to start using applications, but they will need to do that if they intend to share data with other users. Uh, the reason for which is because the... Um, in order to find out where you've hosted your data, I need to have a name because I need to have an entry in, that, in my node's local table to go find out what your routing state is so I can then go and find out where your data is hosted. Um, Off-chain names, I haven't talked about those yet, but we have a way to register names like cicero.respublica.id. Those can be done for practically free. Um, I have an extra slide at the end I can, I can go to if there's questions about that at the end. Um, the intent for off-chain names is to make it easy for users to onboard. Um, I have one called jude.personal.id. Um, they work just the same as on-chain names. Um, they help the system scale up because you can register lots of off-chain names for the cost of a single on-chain name. Um, but anyway, I'll come back to this later if you want to visit this more, but I think the audience here is, I've been told the audience here is primarily interested in building dApps on Blockstack. So a Blockstack dApp um, just runs in your web browser. It's just a typical front page, one page JavaScript app. Um, they build, you build them like normal web apps. Uh, they just use Blockstack.js to access the Blockstack network. 99% um, of your code is just going to be your business logic. Um, it's just a handful of methods that you would use to handle app sign-ons and then uh, loading and storing data to Gaia. Uh, the user runs the Blockstack browser locally to handle sign-in requests because it has an identity wallet, implements a single sign-on endpoint for apps, and it uh, contains the URLs to plus two a trusted Blockstack nodes if you need to talk to them in your app. So the flow looks a bit like this. The user is presented a login with Blockstack button, which they click. Um, when they click it, the user is redirected to their Blockstack browser. Um, which then asks, hey, like when you try to sign into this app, it's going to access your profile and it's going to store data. Do you want to approve? And what Blockstack ID do you want to sign in with? Uh, when the user hits approve, they're redirected back to the application and they're signed in. There's no passwords. There's no need for passwords. And there's no OAuth happening behind the scenes. It's actually something much simpler than that, which I'll talk about in a second. But the flow is very much like that for users. So to sign in, there's really just four methods to be aware of. I have the link at the bottom to the full API listing for blockstack.js. It's uh, blockstack.github.io slash blockstack.js. But there's really just four methods. There's redirect to sign in, which will just do the uh, redirect to the browser. There's the handle pending sign in, which completes the sign in process and gives you back the profile of the user who signed in. There's a method called load user data, which fetches the profile. Um, you can call that at any point in your application. Um, it's just a kit, fetches a copy that's stored to local storage. And there's lookup profile, which can help you find the profile for any user in the system. So if you want to read somebody else's data in your app, you would use lookup profile to go figure out where that data is. Um, storage is even simpler. There's just two methods. There's get file and there's put file. Um, get file and put file both support signing data and encrypting data. You just need to set um, encrypted equals true in the options for put file and uh, same for get file so it will decrypt for you. Um, what happens in the application is the 
upon calling put file, the application uh, generates the ciphertext. It uses the routing information from the block stack node to find out where to write the data to, and then the uh, blockstack.js behind the scenes just pushes that data to the Gaia node, which in turn pushes it to the user's preferred cloud storage. So I write to my Gaia node and you write to your Gaia nodes. And only a user can write to their own storage. I can't write to your storage. I can only write to my own. So we have very real applications working today. Um, probably my favorite ones are just summarized in this list here. There's Graphite, which implements an encrypted Google suite. It has a document editor, a, a spreadsheet app, a fault for sharing files. Uh, we have dot .podcast, which is a podcast player and catalog that lets you tip podcast developers so without any middlemen. Uh, we have Mythos, which is like GitHub, but it lets you share cryptocurrency profits with your contributors. We have a revenue positive app called Bellwether, which does business analytics without third parties. You upload your business, your business data to your browser and not to a third party. You sign in with Blockstack, you train a machine learning model to figure out um, trends in your customer data and you keep your models to yourself. There are people, it just turns out, as these, these guys discovered that need this for their businesses and they could not have achieved this without Blockstack. Uh, we have Coins, which is an encrypted cur cryptocurrency portfolio app. Um, your portfolio, if, you're, if you have cryptocurrencies, you can upload your data to coins. The data is kept private in Gaia because it's encrypted before it leaves your device and it helps you keep track of your investments. Um, there's also Stealthy.im, which is an end-to-end -end encrypted chat app, which also does uh, pictures, and image, pictures and images and text as well as Bitcoin. And there's Blockstagram, which was built in the space of about 36 hours at our last hackathon, just by a team of people who knew nothing about Blockstack coming in. But at the end of it, they had an Instagram workalike that let them share photos with each other in an end-to-end -end encrypted manner. Um, where we're going with this, so right now we're putting, we're putting some of the finishing touches on our mobile SDKs for iOS and Android. Um, we're going to make it possible for users to sign up with off-chain names. Um, the idea being that users can be spared the friction of having to purchase an on-chain name with, uh, with Bitcoin. Um, we're also building out a custom blockchain for Blockstack that anchors itself to the Bitcoin blockchain, but it implements much higher throughput and much lower latency because all of the space in this blockchain will be dedicated to Blockstack transactions instead of having to share the space of the Bitcoin blockchain with the rest of the Bitcoin traffic. Um, all of our code is open source. The core infrastructure is all GPL3, but all of our tooling, including Blockstack JS, are MIT licensed, so you can use them in products without concern. Um, as far as where we're going as a company, we have a, a signature fund that we use to finance people who want to build Blockstack applications. Uh, we also have an app bounty program that we uh, are currently ongoing, and we're about to ramp up in a couple of weeks once we fin put our finishing touches on the uh, our uh, Blockstack app that will handle this. Uh, we're working on public app directories. We intend to make a .app namespace, for example, that will allow app developers to register names, um, register the names of their applications and make them immediately discoverable to all users in the system. And of course, right now we're hiring. Um, so if anything I've said is interesting to you, feel free to drop your CV um, at Blockstack and we'll, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Without further ado, I can give a demo. Uh, I will just need to switch my camera over though because I'm on my mobile phone and I need to turn my camera to my laptop. Let me just uh, get that ready here. Let's see. Let's see if we go. Oops. Let me see if I can stop this share here. Hey everyone, I'm just going to switch the uh, video here. Switch camera. There we go. All right. So I have the Blockstack app, the Blockstack browser loaded here. I'm just going to zoom in a bit. You can see there's the icon for Graphite. Um, there's our forum, hello Blockstack dot podcast, real apps. Um, up in the corner, you can see I have my identity wallet, my settings. I'm just going to show the flow for Graphite here. So I'm going to click sign in with Graphite. And I just got redirected to Graphite's homepage. Own your documents there. Click get started. Ah, here we are. So there's this, there's the uh, proverbial welcome screen with the sign in with Blockstack. If I click that, I'm given the option to open that with a protocol handler. I'm just going to go ahead and do that. 
And as you can see, I just got redirected back to my browser. And if you look closely, you'll see there's um, the sign-in request came from Graphite. It wants to load my, um, my profile, it wants to store data. I'm gonna sign in with jude.personal.id. So I'm gonna go ahead and approve that. And I get redirected back to Graphite. And cool, I'm signed in. I can go ahead and uh, start up a document here. And you can see some other documents I've already created in the past, they're just called Untitled, but let me just go ahead and make a new one. So this is just a, all, almost all of Graphite runs in the front end. So let's type some stuff here. Hello world. Um, so you mean, I mean, if you just look at like the tooling up here, it's a lot like a normal document editor. Um, again, mostly front end, but if I say, when this gets saved, this is being sent to my Gaia hub. Um, so I own the data, it's encrypted, no one else can see it. Um, I can share this, if I can just remember how to share. Uh, here we are, right up here I have a share option. So I don't have any contacts, but I can share it publicly and I can also go and add some contacts with which I can share. There we are, contacts. Oh, do Zan. I know his ID is zanboss.id. Oh, I have to hit new contact. So this is just pulling our information straight from our Explorer. Um, anybody can run an Explorer, so the Explorer is not part of our trusted computing base. Go ahead and add zan.id right here. Let me go see if I can share that document with him now. Yeah, export, here we are. There's my contact, share it with Zan. So what happened was I encrypted, what Graphite did in the background is it shared, it, it took my document and it encrypted it with Zan's public key, which it obtained from my block stack node. Um, if, it, if, I, if you don't have to have one running locally, mind you, if you don't have one running locally, it will just ask uh, the core.blockstack.org and get his public key that way. So now Zan, when he opens Graphite next, will see that he has a document available to him. Or, I could, or what have to, will have to happen is I'll just uh, tell him that he has available and he can go ahead and load it. Um, Graphite sees none of the data. What's really, so all, the, all that Graphite sees is, um, uh, sorry, all that Graphite sees is just my, uh, my ciphertext. They don't actually see application data. So let me go ahead and go back to the slide deck here. So that said, are there any questions? I think we're at the end of the, of the uh, talk here. I can talk more about uh, deeper questions like the um, uh, off-chain names or a d deeper dive into um, how we're different from Ethereum or EOS. All right, hold on. We have a couple questions in the chat. Okay, um, uh, Valerie is asking the question. I have uh, installed the block st uh, stack browser on my Windows 10 laptop, but it says that I cannot purchase username in this build. Is there another way to purchase my username at this time? If so, what is the fee? Okay, um, so we're actually about to fix that. The Windows build is unable to purchase names because right now the stable build of the browser requires a locally running Python process. That has since been removed and we're maybe a week away from shipping that. Um, so I'll, I'm just trying to assure you that it's not a permanent thing. The, um, in order to purchase a name on Windows, I'd recommend going to browser.blockstack.org and just using the hosted version. Um, another option is to run it in a Linux virtual machine or to run it on Mac OS. The, uh, the fee for the name is dependent on how long the name is. Uh, cheaper names are longer and expensive names are shorter. Um, the price curve itself is set by rules encoded in the transactions that created the .id namespace. Um, I believe this remembering off the top of my head here, like one character names are by far the most expensive. They cost, I think, 0.4 Bitcoin, but a 
two character namespace would cost 0.04. Um, three characters cost 0.04. It just de it decreases exponentially from there. The dominant portion of the fee is the transaction fee for a longish name. All right, I have another question. So what is your business model for the block stack? Are you deriving your revenue from the, uh, uh, the proceeds from the name sale? Um, so we actually don't receive any of the name fees. When you purchase a name, the fee gets sent to a burn address on Bitcoin. So it's, it's just the, uh, the address of the uh, public key hash of all zeros. So it's computationally intractable to figure out what the public and private key pair are for that. The money is destroyed be, uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, first, we don't want to become a central point in this system. Like we just, we see ourselves, like Blockstack is a public benefits corporation. We see ourselves as more of the stewards of the technology than the beneficiaries of it. Um, and second, we destroy the Bitcoin instead of, for example, giving it to miners uh, because we want everybody to pay the same rate for names. It's meant as an anti-squatting feature more than anything else. The business model of Blockstack, um, right? So we just executed a token sale to accredited investors. Um, we raised just over $50 million, um, but it was structured like a series B round. So we have a couple of benchmarks we have to meet before we can unlock all of the funding. Uh, the to one aspect of that that's coming up by the end of this year is we're going to launch our own blockchain, which will have native support for Blockstack tokens, and the tokens will be used instead of Bitcoin for purchasing names. In addition, each namespace in the system will be given the option to produce its own token. The idea being that applications can make their own namespaces and in doing so receive their own tokens and their own app-specific names. The state for namespaces will be anchored to the Blockstack blockchain in the same way the Blockstack blockchain will be anchored to the Bitcoin blockchain. The idea being that each namespace gets its own dedicated space for transactions of its tokens um, without interfering with anybody else's. This is a step above what Ethereum does right now by making everybody share the same block space and in doing so driving up transaction fees. But anyway, that's, that's a, a deep in the weeds description. Um, the high level bit is that um, Blockstack PBC has some of the tokens allocated to itself that we intend to put in the company treasury, um, which we'll use to um, finance the development of Blockstack applications. In addition, we, are, we have a, a signature fund that I mentioned earlier, which we use to invest in applications building on our, on our infrastructure. And that's the current state of the world for our business plan. All right. All right, so another question. Do you mind to take us through how you used Blockstack to raise the series for the 15 million? Okay, so what we, uh, so this is less of a technical question and more of a business development question. Um, the high level description is that we came up with a way for both accredited and non accredited investors to participate. We went through a uh, platform called CoinList, which is a play on words of the more famous uh, AngelList application. Um, but what, the, what CoinList d did for us is they um, uh, helped us structure the uh, legal requirements for the sale such that accredited investors could invest because they're obviously accredited as long as they went through a KYC process first, which uh, CoinList handled. Um, we also had an option for non-accredited investors to receive a voucher from us um, that can be, that is not a promise, but it's just a voucher they can use um, to redeem tokens at the same strike price as the accredited investors once the token system goes live. So no one's received any tokens yet because the token system doesn't actually exist yet. We're in the process of building it. Um, but anyway, the money, the 50 million I mentioned came from accredited investors. Um, when we execute the token system, the non-accredited investors will be able to execute their vouchers and we intend to raise more money that way as well. But by which point um, the system being already existing and already working uh, will no longer be considered in the eyes, will no longer be considered as a potential on the regulated security. We're treating this um, as a security right now out of an abundance of caution, even though we do not believe it is. Um, but we're checking every legal step possible to make sure that this is um, as, as legally sound as, as we can make it. Uh, the, the application itself that we used um, to execute the sale was actually built on Blockstack. Um, it was a Blockstack app that showed up in the browser. Um, when you click it, it 
allowed us to um, uh, receive, it allowed, it allowed us to verify your intent to acquire a voucher. Um, if you were an accredited investor, it also uh, linked your Blockstack ID to a, your, a, your, your uh, KYC information that uh, CoinList happens to host. All right. All right, so I have uh, another question this, uh, why name coin is not sufficiently secure? Can you show your experience in with blockchain security in general and uh, why did you choose the Bitcoin bl uh, blockchain? That's a good question. Um, so as it turned, when, when Blockstack was first created, it used name coin to store a lot of the same state that you currently saw in the routing state aspect of the system. Um, name coin is very similar to Bitcoin architecturally. The only main difference is, is that you can store up to 520 bytes of ancillary data per transaction instead of Bitcoin's 80 bytes. The reason why Namecoin is not secure is because Namecoin is, first of all, merge mined uh, with Bitcoin miners. What that means is that a Bitcoin miner, by participating in merge mining, can receive both a coin base from Bitcoin and a coin base from Namecoin. Um, the second problem is that, obviously, Namecoin just isn't as popular as Bitcoin. But the confluence of events there uh, meant that what happened was not every miner in this in the bitcoin system participated in merge mining i think only one of them actually seriously participated but the unfortunate consequence to dame coin there was that that single merge miner was a small fraction of the bitcoin mining power but it was like 60 percent of the name coin mining power which meant that name coin was effectively centralized and they were centralized for a long time like months six months or so when nobody noticed the nobody noticing is actually the scariest part to me because when Bitcoin, um, at, back a few years back when, uh, when uh, ghash.io was still around as a mining pool, they managed to get 50.1% of Bitcoin's mining pool. And everybody had a conniption about it. Like it was on top of Hacker News. It was in all the tech news articles like, oh my God, Bitcoin's broken, Bitcoin's centralized. And of course it backed off after that because of, of social pressure. That, those network effects don't exist for Namecoin. So Namecoin went for a long time being um, centrally mined by one of Bitcoin's merge miners. And it was actually Muneeb Ali, who's the other co-founder who discovered this and reported on it in his PhD thesis. Um, it's actually one of the key findings of his thesis that merge mining fails in practice, unless you can get everybody to merge mine out of the chain you're merge mining with. Right. So in other, in other words, the side chains are not as easy to implement as it sounds. Right. It will depend on the consensus model. Um, in Bitcoin's particular case, um, because they're based on Nakamoto consensus, the same way that Bitcoin is, like the person who has the most hashing power, um, if they have over 51% of the hashing power, they, they set the rules for the system. And that was, that was the case with Namecoin. I would say like tangentially it's possible to do side chains if you're willing to do something like a federation of miners or some other sort of consensus construction, but that would obviously be a whole different um, ballpark at that point insofar as like what that means for your application security. Like, do you trust the federation members, for example? Yeah, correct. All right. The, another question, like follow up. Uh, why do you plan to move from Bitcoin blockchain to create your own blockchain? Ah, so that's a good question. So one thing we discovered during the token sale, um, this coincided with probably the highest transaction fees I've ever seen in Bitcoin. It was that super high price rise that happened around uh, December or so. That's about when we were executing. And it was costing people north of $50 to buy usernames. Like that's, that's pretty unreasonable. Um, what we, so there's a couple things. So there's that. There's, there's the pressure to not use Bitcoin space. Um, so you pay for the space with a transaction fee because you're competing with everybody else trying to get their transactions mined. So th there's, the, there's that pressure on our end to not force users to compete with the rest of the Bitcoin network for space. Um, but there's also that pressure I just talked about, which is like you don't want your own blockchain unless you can get everybody to merge mine on us so you can re get the security properties that, that Bitcoin offers. So the design of our blockchain is actually pretty unique. It's not a standalone chain the same way that um, Bitcoin or Ethereum is, but what you do instead, and this is described in our white paper, is miners in the Stacks blockchain will burn Bitcoin to mine instead of burning electricity. Um, from a game theory standpoint, it works out about the same way. You're destroying Bitcoin, which is about the same as destroying electricity. So by burning Bitcoin, and proving I've burned Bitcoin, that gets you the right to mine some Stacks transactions. 
So the Stacks blockchain runs in parallel to the Bitcoin blockchain, but the validation logic for transactions is a bit different. Because my, the miners in this system aren't um, blocked on discovering the next block, as in having to wait 10 minutes or so to discover the next proof of work puzzle, what we're doing instead is a technique similar to uh, Bitcoin NG, if you're familiar with that. What happens is of the set of people who burn Bitcoin over a particular window of time, the, fr the fraction of Bitcoin you burn is like relative to the total amount of Bitcoin burn. Um, that varies between zero and one for you. That fraction is proportional to the probability that you will be selected as the next miner. So let's say it happens over the space of a week or a thousand and eight blocks. So if over the next, so suppose I burn one Bitcoin and suppose that a thousand other people also burn one Bitcoin. So that means I have a one in a thousand chance of being selected as the stacks validator. And what will happen is as the system progresses um, over the course of the next week or so, um, if I'm selected for being the next uh, leader in the system, I can now mine transactions out of the mempool. I can broadcast micro blocks. Um, so transactions will confirm as soon as I sign off on them and propagate them, uh, et cetera. And they, uh, it gives you the same security properties as you would have out of Bitcoin, but you have a much better uh, user experience insofar as uh, transaction confirmation times. Because you're no longer waiting 10 minutes for me to mine a block. You're just waiting uh, for your transaction to get cleared by whoever is the current miner. So right. the, uh, right, so the, so the, the, the high-level takeaways there are you get fast confirmation times because we're separating the problem of mining a block from uh, determining who's the next leader in the system. And we're saving users money by making sure that the transactions aren't competing with Bitcoin. Uh, in fact, users won't even need to buy Bitcoin when the system goes live. They'll, just, they'll, they'll be able to do everything natively in stacks. It's only people who want to mine stacks that'll have to buy Bitcoin because they'll have to go and burn it in order to become selected as, as the chain's validator. Um, so that's one of the reasons we're building our own blockchain. Um, the second reason has to do more with uh, system-wide scalability. So we have this thesis that we're, that, we, that we're building our apps off of, and that is every successful application that needs a blockchain, that, sorry, that needs a blockchain will have to build a blockchain. Um, this is a lesson learned, I think, by watching Ethereum with like CryptoKitties and with the various popular ICOs that preceded it. The minute your application becomes popular on Ethereum is the minute the Ethereum network grinds to a halt because everybody is trying to use your application and it crowds out everyone else. That's pretty toxic to other app developers. And it's also toxic to users of the system that just want to transact. So what we're trying to do in addition to making the Stacks blockchain run in parallel with the Bitcoin blockchain is that same technique can be used to create namespace specific blockchains that in turn burn Stacks to mine a namespace specific tokens. So each namespace gets its own blockchain that is secured by the Stacks blockchain and the Stacks blockchain is then secured by the Bitcoin blockchain. So transitively, everybody's namespace specific blockchains will be had the same security properties as the Bitcoin blockchain, but at the same time, every namespace, AKA every application, gets a dedicated amount of chain space for hosting their transactions that so they don't have to compete with other people for. Um, the other cool thing here is that as a user, you only need to track the application chains that you care about. So suppose I make uh, .CryptoKitties and .CryptoDoggies on, on the Stacks blockchain. If I only want to use .crypto doggies, I only have to track the Stacks blockchain plus the .crypto doggies namespace. I don't have to track the .crypto kitties namespace at all. But at the same time now, uh, crypto kitties and crypto doggies can coexist without trampling over each other or congesting the network. So th those two main so th those those two main things making it cheaper for users to transact and also making it so that the system can handle a large number of applications under load are the reasons we're trying to build our own system. We're not giving up the security of Bitcoin. We're just finding a way to make the most use of Bitcoin's hash power. Understood. Another question to follow up. What are your thoughts on the Lightning Network? Are there any synergies with the block stack? It's funny you ask that because we're actually good friends with Elizabeth Stark. Um, we love what she's doing and she loves what we're doing. We'd love to make it possible to integrate Lightning into the browser at some point so that you can send Lightning payments from user to user or from user to hub, however you want to structure it. Uh, we have an ongoing collaboration with them. Uh, it's still pretty early though because they're obviously still um, getting their, their, their system tested and live. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're friends with them and we're, we're enthusiastic about their work.
And as a question, so what is the step or how can I integrate block stack in my applications? What are the high level steps that developers need to keep in mind? Can you just go over it again? Yeah, sure. Um, let me, is my uh, slide deck still showing on the presentation window? Yes. Okay, maybe I can find a way to go back to that. List the APIs here. So, the so what Blockstack JS gets you um, is two things primarily. It gets you identity and it gets you storage. So, if you're building a Blockstack app, you don't have to worry about storing data at all. Um, you also don't have to worry about handling uh, passwords or user user identity databases or anything like that. Um, I'm happy to direct you to uh, our YouTube channel where we show how to from start to finish how to build a Blockstack app. Um, all that really has to happen are handling user sign-ins using these four API calls here. Um, you'll notice there is no uh, OAuth magic or no none of the conventional um, uh, sign-in with Facebook or sign-in with Google stuff. It's really much simpler in this way. So once you handle the sign-in and get the user's profile, you can go ahead and load and store data um, just via get file and put file. Um, the path here can be any string. It's just an, it's like a key value store. Um, options just control like the level of security that you want. Do you want it encrypted or do you not want it encrypted? Um, so just, just using these two sets of methods to handle sign-ins and then to handle um, reads and writes, um, that's all you need to get started. Like the app itself only can just, the app itself can just live in an S3 bucket. It doesn't need any of its own state. It just needs to have a website that can serve it. Uh, we actually build most of our apps out of React, um, if that helps too. I think our tutorials also use React. All right. Do the application developers need to run your node to validate no, the transaction? Uh, no, they do not. They, if they don't want to run their own node, they would just defer to one of the public ones that we run. It's more secure, obviously, if you run your own node um, because then you don't have to trust anyone else. Um, but from a convenience standpoint, it makes sense to try to make sure it works with the public ones as well because users probably won't uh, install it at first, but will be inclined to install it afterwards. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. Private key management question. I typed mm -hmm. them. I typed, typed tons of questions for you. <laughs> How do end user manage private keys? I know you uh, mentioned it just slightly. Can you elaborate uh, on it a little bit more? Sure. So each user is given a BIP39 mnemonic. Um, that is a private, th then from that uh, private key that's encoded by that mnemonic, uh, we derive your identity key, we derive your Bitcoin wallet key, we derive all of your application keys. As long as you have that 12 word mnemonic, you can restore all of your application and browser state on any computer. Um, insofar as how we ensure the user backs up those private keys, um, we require the user to write it down and then type it back into the onboarding flow. And in, in addition, we encrypt the 12 word phrase with a password that the user chooses and we optionally mail it to the user. We email it to the user. So, I mean, that's optional, obviously, in case you're especially paranoid and don't want your mail provider to see it. But as a convenience factor, it's great for users because it means that if they ever lose their computer or forget the 12 word phrase or go a long time without having to enter it and forget it, um, they'll have a recovery option. All right, sounds good. Uh, one more question. Any plans to integrate hardware wallets such as Trezor or Ledger? We'd love to. Um, we just don't have the bandwidth right now, um, but there's nothing special or magical about our transaction formats. Uh, every, the first input is always your owner private key and the second inputs and on are always uh, payment keys that fund the transaction. So uh, it's really just a matter of doing the engineering like work uh, to make that happen. Like, we'd love to have a bounty for that at some point. Very interesting, very good. All right, so I run out of questions as of right now. It's almost an hour. Anybody else would like to ask? Okay. Um, another question, uh, what kind of uh, dApps are you looking for with your bounties? So I don't have the bounty list in front of me right now, unfortunately, um, but we, I know that stealthy.im, let me just scroll back to the uh, DAP list. Oops, overshot. I know that stealthy.im was a bounty winner. We had a bounty for a decentralized chat app and they won it. Uh, Coins was also a bounty winner. Um, if you want to email, uh, if you want to send us an email, like we, we're happy to hook you up. 
Um, we're also happy to have you on our Slack and we can discuss that because we're, we're also looking for ideas. Like if there's something that people want that we just aren't seeing, like we're happy to help get that off the ground. All right, sounds good. Any more questions from the audience? I'm just following up on the bounty system. We're act in a few weeks, we're gonna be releasing a uh, public uh, bounty list that will allow people to just post bounties to get to uh, um, uh, get stuff done that they're interested in. Um, I don't have very many details on it yet because it's still kind of under wraps, but um, we'll, we'll be announcing it in a few weeks and that should help get the ball rolling on that a bit more. It'll be an app in the Blockstack browser. All right, sounds good. All right, so I see there are no more questions so far. Jude, thank you very much. That was a very useful presentation. Thanks for having me.